general types of solution sets to a linear system of equations. You could have one unique solution or a single point. If your system is inconsistent and there are no solutions, that is a second option. Sometimes we say that an inconsistent system has the empty set as its solution set. Or you could have infinitely many solutions that make up a linear space. By a linear space, we mean a space that can be defined by an equation that only has variables raised to the first power. A line and a plane are examples of linear spaces, but you could have a three-dimensional space inside of a fourth dimension or higher space, or you could have a fourth dimensional space inside of a fifth dimension or higher space, etc. As long as the space is defined by an equation in which the variables are raised only to the first power. Notice for a linear system, it is not possible to have two exact solutions or three exact solutions. You either have one unique solution, no solutions, or you have infinitely many solutions because they lie on a line or a plane or some higher dimension space. If you have a unique solution to a system of linear equations, then there will be the same number of equations as variables. And those equations need to be independent of each other. That means that no equation can be obtained from the others by any combination of the elementary row operations. Now, a caveat to that is that if you start off with more equations than you have variables, then just naturally some of the equations are going to be linear combinations of the other equations and it'll reduce down to a system in which you have the same number of equations as variables. So what we're really talking about is if you start off with the same number of equations as variables, if you have a unique solution, those equations will be independent of each other. Also, the columns will be independent of each other. That means that no column vector is a linear combination of the other column vectors. We will talk more about linear combinations in the next unit, but a linear combination is a sum of scalar multiples of vectors. So for example, if I take two times column vector one plus five times column vector two minus 17.3 times column vector three, I'm creating a linear combination of the column vectors. If there is only a unique solution or one point, then the coefficient matrix is made up of independent column vectors. And when you apply all of the elementary row operations and you completely row reduce it to its row reduced echelon form, you will always obtain the identity matrix. We have a few examples here. Our first example, we had a two by two system. We had two variables and two equations. When we RREF'd the system, notice the coefficient matrix turned into the two by two identity matrix. We then read that result as one times X plus zero times Y equals three, or X equals three. And then the second row is read zero times X plus one times Y equals negative one, or Y equals negative one. So the two lines cross in only the point three, negative one. We have another example that was a three by three, three variables, three equations. And we're able to graph that system also because we live in a 3D world, so we can graph three dimensional ideas. So the, each equation was represented by a plane. Those three planes intersect in a single point. All three planes intersect in only that one point. So when we took the system and we applied the elementary row operations or had our calculator or Desmos do that for us, and we REF the system, notice the coefficient matrix is the identity matrix, the, the three by three identity matrix. So we read that first row as one times X plus zero times Y plus zero times Z equals 20 thirteenths, or X is equal to 20 thirteenths. The second row is read zero times X plus one times Y plus zero times Z equals nine thirteenths, or Y equals nine thirteenths. And the third row, we read it as one times Z equals negative 16 thirteenths. 
So those three planes intersect in only the unique solution, 20 thirteenths for x, 9 thirteenths for y, negative 16 thirteenths for z. And that idea is expanded to any dimension. So also shown is a 5 by 5 coefficient matrix that's been RREF to a 5 by 5 identity matrix. And again, you read each row as coefficients of the five variables. So that first row is x sub 1 is equal to that messy fraction, negative 696 over 215. The second row is read 0 times x1 plus 1 times x2 plus 0 times x3, etc. Or it's telling you that x sub 2 is equal to 496 over 215 x sub 3 is 28 over 43, x sub 4 is 621 over 215, and the, the last variable, the fifth variable, is negative 382 over 215. So if you have a unique solution, your coefficient matrix is made up of independent column vectors and independent equations, and the coefficient matrix will always completely RREF to the identity matrix. And then from that, you can just read off the single point as your solution. If you have no solution, you can have any number of equations and variables. There's no stipulation of having to have the same number of variables as equations. You can have more or less. But all of the equations do not intersect in any common point. So if you have a two by two, you have two variables, two equations, it means you have two parallel lines and the two parallel lines do not intersect. If you have a three by three, then you have three planes that do not intersect in the same place. Two of the planes can intersect, but all three of them do not intersect in a common point. And the same idea can be expanded to higher dimensions. For example, if you have five variables and you're working in the fifth dimension, all of the equations do not intersect in any common point. How you can tell from your matrix that you have no solution is that some discrepancy shows up. Here we have some examples of augmented matrices. So again, the first few columns are the coefficient matrix and the last column is the set of constants that are on the other side of the equal sign. So in each of these, we have a discrepancy. In the two by two that we see there, that second row is read zero times x plus zero times y equals one, or zero equals one. Well, zero can't equal one, so there's your discrepancy. In the three by three, we also see that same discrepancy show up. The, the third row says zero times x plus zero times y plus zero times z equals one, Again, zero doesn't equal one, so there's your discrepancy telling you that it doesn't work out. You, you ended up with a false statement that can't be true, hence that showed up because there's no solution. And again, that holds up in any dimension. Now, if you've completely row reduced your augmented matrix, your discrepancy is going to show up as zero equals one. But if you're working by hand with the equations, you might actually notice the discrepancy before you've completely row reduced it. You know, you, you might end up getting, you know, three equals five or, you know, something along the way if you're working by hand. But if you do completely row reduce your, your augmented matrices, the discrepancy shows up as zeros across a row of your coefficient matrix set equal to one in the augmented part of your matrix. If you have infinitely many solutions for a linear system of equations, then the points in the solution set lie on some linear space, meaning the space can be described by an equation in which all the variables are raised to the first power. We're shown some examples here where we have three planes intersecting in a line. You can see the line going through all three planes Every point on that line, if you plug it into the original system, you'll get agreement. That is, the points satisfy the system. If you started off with some two by two equations and they reduced to a line, it meant that 
all of the equations were really the same equation. And when you graph, they just graph right on top of each other and every point on that line is a solution. You also could have a plane. Every point on the plane is a solution. And if you plug it into your original system, you get agreement for all the equations. So these are some examples that we were able to draw pictures of, but your infinite solu solution space could be a three-dimensional space inside of a higher dimension or a four-dimensional space inside of a higher dimension. You know, we don't have to just have solution sets that are lines or planes, but we can only graph ones that are lines or planes because we live in a three-dimensional world. Here are some examples of how to read the solution sets from completely row-reduced augmented matrices. So again, you've represented your system with an augmented matrix. You've applied the elementary row operations until you've completely worked it down as far as you can. However, we'll generally use our calculator or something like Desmos to do that for us. We will end up with these RREF augmented matrices. So off to the right, we have a three by three and it row reduced to the following augmented matrix. And I read those rows as one times X plus zero times Y minus 11 ninths times Z equals 10 ninths. And the second row, zero times X plus one times Y minus five ninths times Z equals negative 11 ninths. So notice I'm writing X and Y in terms of Z. Z is my independent variable. Usually when we state our solution set, we're going to state it in point or vector form. And in this case, Z is the independent variable, so it's representing itself. And then X and Y are defined by these formulas according to what we got in the augmented matrix. So X can be rewritten as 10 ninths plus 11 ninth Z. Y can be rewritten as negative 11 ninths plus 5 ninth Z. And then again, Z is itself. So pick any number you want for Z, and then X and Y, though, have to be defined by those formulas. If you do that, any point you get will be a solution to the system of equations. Um, notice our, in the middle we have a 2 by 2, and after we row reduced it, we ended up just with one non-zero row, and so it reduced down to one line. We read that as X minus 1 third Y equals negative 2 thirds, so I can take that information and X can be defined in terms of Y. Y can be the independent variable. I also could rewrite that and solve for Y and written in terms of X. Um, but I, I'm just going to kind of go with the same system here where the variable farther down the line is going to be the independent one. So Z was the independent for the first example. Y is the independent for the second example. So notice I've listed my solution set as negative two-thirds plus one-third y, and then y. So pick any y you want, x has to be defined by that formula. And then any point you get will be a solution to the system. You also could have um, three equations that reduce down to a single plane. Um, so notice I get two rows of zeros, and then that first row is red, x minus one-third y plus two-thirds z equals five-thirds. And so then if I rewrite that, I'll solve for x, and x will then be five-thirds plus one-third y minus two-thirds z. y and z are both independent variables. I have two independent variables, and x is defined by both of them. But when I state my solution set, notice in the place of X, I put a formula that relies on Y and Z, and then Y and Z are representing themselves. You can pick any numbers you want for Y and Z, but then X is defined according to what you chose for Y and Z. All those points will be a specific plane, and every point on that plane will be a solution to the system. These ideas can be extended into higher dimensions. Here we have four equations and six variables, and I have an augmented matrix in which all of the equations are set equal to zero. 
I know this augmented matrix looks a little different because I was typing the matrices in Desmos and Desmos on only allows you to put six columns. So the seventh column I had to tack on. Um, by the way, if all of your equations are set equal to zero, the solution set has a special name called the null space. So we have found the null space of this system. So for this particular system, it RREF to this you know, final augmented matrix. And that first row is read one times x1 minus three times x2 plus zero times x3 minus 14 times x4 plus zero times x5 minus 37 times x6 equals zero. So x sub one can be rewritten in terms of x2, x4, and x6. x2, x4, and x6 are my independent variables. The second row is read zero times x1 plus zero times x2 plus one times x3 plus three times x4 plus zero times x5 plus four times x6 equals zero. And x3, doesn't involve x2, but it can be rewritten in terms of x4 and x6. The third row has 0 times x1, 0 times x2, 0 times x3, 0 times x4, and then 1 times x5 plus 5 times x6 equals 0. So x5 can be rewritten in terms of x6. So again, x2, x4, x6 are my independent variables and x1, x3, and x5 are written in terms of those three. So my final solution set is written below. x1 is defined according to its formula involving x2, x4, and x6. x2 can be any number you want. x3 is defined in terms of x4 and x6. x4 can be any number you want x5 is defined in terms of x6, and x6 can be any number you want. So pick any values for x2, x4, and x6 that you want. Once you pick those, then you have to follow these formulas to get the other three variables, and any point that satisfies that would be a solution to your system of equations. I can't draw a graph of the solution set for you because it's in a too high of a dimension, but you know, you can imagine it's some sort of non-curved <laughs> higher dimension space. Mm -hmm.